Okay. Yeah. Pronto. Okay, so they asked me to briefly speak about my city, but this weekend was raining, so we invented a new theory. You know, Miss Van der Rohe said, you can invent a new architecture every Monday morning, but sometimes we can. So I try to deal with a problem I find, I would say a problem of approach in the relationship between design, you know, uh, rereading back Christopher Alexander notes on the synthesis of form, uh, in his critics to functionalist design, one could say. And I think when we do things, we, as, a, as a children, you know, uh, pose ourselves a problem, we try to use our mind to look at issues and find solutions, but also somehow we have the possibility to learn from somebody else who done the same thing before. So we do, we learn by doing, as animals do in a way, and then we also have one thing more, which is learning how to build a bomb from internet, you know, something that was uh, knowledge which is a collective, collective storage or going on on Wikipedia. And I think functionalism somehow uh, made a diagram. I mean, I'm simplifying very much. Uh, the idea that you can have a process where you look at data, you look at a problem, you somehow have some kind of algorithm of method to elaborate this data and you have a response. So this could be the diagram in its most simple form of an input-output process. A typical input-output process is that the more we push on the pedal, the faster we go. And if we see the police, we take away the pedal, you know, we brake and we go slow. But then sometimes uh, the response is not instantaneous. We have a delay. So th the response to our input is delayed in time. If today we decide we're old enough uh, you know, to reproduce our species or not to reproduce our species because the world does not deserve our uh, genes, the fact of what we do, that, that's taken from the book of I found when my grandfather was dead, I found this erotic book, 100 Position of Love, you know, a very holy way of making love, protecting yourself in an integral way. But then it said, this, the diagram of the population is shifted. This is the diagram of the population in Japan after the war. So the effect of an act we do today, it will go appear later in time. This is true for politicians, for example. When a politician starts a new subway system, the next politician will open it up. In this case, it's Vittorio Sgarbi opening up uh, the, in, in the project we did in uh, Portello, you know, the, the inaugurating. So each politician inaugurates the, the defect of his previous politician. Oh, sorry, there's, there's a name missing. And uh, but if we think of architecture as sort of an input-output uh, process, what is the input of architecture? In a classical way, one could say culture would join uh, the technical aspects and the, the, say, the well-learned one. Uh, Europe has a tradition of being sort of, architecture is not an empiric empirical matter, just a response, but it has some kind of higher aims. And in the classical times, these were joined. In, in a treatise, as you would find reference to uh, you know, Romanity, joined with how you would you make a mortar. In this case, uh, it's, it's a drawing by Palladio. Uh, when he did major drawings, he went to Rome, and the rotonda, of course. But then in more recent time, one could somehow the, the, the world split up in two. You have this idea that architecture is closer to the other arts. This in case is Carlo Molino, who was also famous to, for doing these erotic pictures. And inspiration is the, the input of the architect. Or on the other side, 
you could think of an architect as, in this case, Jean Prouvé, was almost an engineer in, in a white apron doing teamwork, starting in this case from, you know, the, 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 the lack of housing after the war, do prefabricated housing and so on. There's, once I met uh, Bernard Schumi in Milano, he was around with some students, we met on the street and he said, Chino Zucchi, today the world is split in two. You have the, uh, he said, the signature architects who do, and he went like this, and the production architects who put elevators and stair blocks inside what the signature architects do. But then in a way, for some reason, uh, modernist thinking about town planning uh, felt the old model uh, was useless. So they tried to make some kind of uh, transpose to the scale of the city these input-output projects and the organicity of the result uh, would sort of bec become a natural uh, output of this way of thinking, you know, this Victor Gruen ideal city. But this actually was taken from a book my father brought me back, I think it was 64, 65, from New York. It was a New York's fair. And I was totally convinced when I grew old, I would live, live like the Jetsons with my little helicopter in this uh, city. But this is, can be seen also as a metaphor of the way functionalists thought about the city. You know, to start from the functions, the function of dwelling, the function of circulating, the function of having fun, of working, uh, respond singularly to, to these functions and then put it all back together. Actually, you have some cases where architects felt uh, good enough or that enough to reinvent the city, you know, Brodacre City by Franklin Wright or Chandigarh in a very peculiar political condition was born. I mean, Chandigarh. And I recently, we, we studied and studied, I mean, at least our generation on these drawings, seeing this beautiful, almost poem de Langdois and proportional, almost golden ratio apply to the scale of the city. A couple of years ago, they invited me in Chandigarh to give a lecture, and I went to visit uh, you know, the, the Corbusier capital. It was barbed wire all over. This is barbed wire dividing the big space in between the capital and the secretary. So the, actually, this big, big space does not function at all when it gets really, really damp and very hot in Chandigarh, because in the summer, Punjab has a, a very, very hot and damp climate. And it's very interesting because you see these even fantastic pieces of Le Corbusier, this is just a, a side housing next to, to the capital, lived in for many, many years, the Brice Soleil full of uh, you know, air conditioning, the, the modular the, the, as the backdrop of just a bureaucratic office and so on. But really, the, it does not work the way Le Corbusier planned it. Even the word cap Capitolium, you know, it's, it was supposed to be a big forum. And now you can enter the single pieces. And after 50 years of uh, lived-in city, like, in, like a shoe that you need to think, it's very interesting also to see what, you know, people done with it. And to me, it exactly is a city works very well. It's very desirable. It's very strange because the streets are, think, as circulation, not as places to live in. So it's, it's, uh, the traffic is very good, and it, it's an interesting, and all, this called still the sectors. You have sector 19, sector 15, it sounds a little bit like Blade Runner-ish in, in name. Just to say that those um, examples I, sh I showed, it was somebody with very good intentions starting to look at problems, but without really have the possibility of interacting, I mean, simplifying a little bit. Today, we can treasure this kind of experience, which are not so often, because you don't get to, to, to build a city anew, maybe in Far East you can, but, and we can think of a more complex um, process, the one which implied the feedback, so the output somehow re-regulates and retunes the input. A typical feedback process is the one of a plane with a tail 
uh, no, the tails of the plane. In a way, if the plane inclines, the pressure of the air um, would uh, sort of uh, increase the force on the tail, and so to get gets the plane right. So the stabilizer, some process of P feedback, they tend to equilibrium to stabilize the process. But some process of feedback tend to amplify. This is a typical when the microphone uh, whistles because you know the output, the amplified voice gets into the microphone again, gets re-amplified until you get e shrieking. So not all the feedback processes are converging to an equilibrium. But also in the feedback process, you can have the issue of time. So uh, the feedback could be regulate the input in a delayed way. And that's what I called the cam. campsite shower theory. When you go in a campsite and you take a shower, you, you switch on the, you turn on the, the faucet and the, the water is really cold. So you try to get it hot and for a while nothing happens. So it's still cold. So you, you, you go on the hot side and then you go more and more and more until somehow it gets too hot and then you turn it back and for a while it gets too hot until you get it right. And this, actually, mathematicians study this phenomenon, and with this, uh, one could call it oversteering. You know, you have to wait, patience, they say. In mathematical terms, you need patience to, help, to uh, wait for the, for the effect of your feedback to act. And in the end, it tends to stabilize to the right temperature if you have, uh, you know, if you patient enough. Of course, you have the mathematics of it. I will not go into Nyquist diagram, people who study uh, reactive mathematical systems we use every day. They studied in the mathematics of it. But of course, even this delay can have different times. Example of self-adaptive, very quick uh, feedback systems, when somebody announces the rain comes out, all of a sudden from nowhere, vous comprenez, pop up from nowhere and with an umbrella you see every time here. So you have a very, very fast self-regulating system of selling umbrellas when you have this, or when you announce a new soccer game, all of a sudden this pop up with big scarves and so on. So this is a typical uh, example of self-regulating systems in a city who affect the way we live. Another interesting one is one who also implies uh, workloads of architects or interior decorators. Uh, the, 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 the electronic cigarettes was invented and then was uh, all these pop-up stores came up and then it was prohibited and then Ver Veronese is the most famous cancer theorist he said it's not so bad so this uh, affect the city in a sense that if you go around you see many graphics working on it many stores so this feedback even the the city always tries to readapt itself to the new inventions or functions. And this feedback system generated a, a, a more, more a bigger attention to the, you know, the user. In this case, you could say, is it a user or consumer? But what the famous uh, uh, died in um, Tintin Capo, died in peace by Benetton. Basically, instead of dyeing the wools before knitting them, Benetton made white. Um, sweaters and then he waited for the people to respond. If, if they wanted very much pink sweaters, then they dyed them when they were already uh, made up. So they could have a very fast response to the market. One could say that if for first, um, say, modern theory looked for the typical man, you know, the 40, uh, we had a belief that we could state general needs for everybody, the needs of the air, the needs of the, you know, the, 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 the sun, the air, uh, playing like this. It was an idealized, almost modular man. In this case, we are, there's a society, even as consumer societies, who goes more and more into the idea of characters, that we are not equal. So the theory of physiognomics or pathognomics of the 1800 today are used to uh, divide our in a, 
in a different sets of consumers, in this case the diagram of innovators, thinkers, achievers, experiences and so on. So we feel a little bit like we're rats in a, in a cage. But for example, the other day I started chatting with a Jewish girl that I didn't know on internet and after two days I, on internet I start getting uh, ad advice will say, find your own ancestors, are you an Ashkenazi and so on, which means every time we do something we really uh, we are watched. Yeah. This interactive, you know, the, all this, some people are starting to say, are we sure that the smart city is not a big system of control? Everybody talks about, oh, the smart city, the smart city. Maybe the smart city is the most uh, Orwellian cities around, you know. It depends who has the control. And in this case, you have some kind of, uh, there's Dan Sperber talking about the, the epidem epidem epidemiology of uh, representations, the fact that you have these words, like, you know, um, somehow things, even ideas, even our approaches, the way we deal with the city, uh, they tend to spread around and have moments of success and they go down. Let's talk about words like sustainability, now resilience, resilience, resilience. I mean, w this will, it's a very interesting word applied to the city, to be sincere, but you know, after a while words, they sort of lose their meaning. And this system could work all right. One could say maybe the lifespan of our buildings is not as long as the, the old ones, but then somehow we feel something is not totally right. This is a photogra photographer who uh, takes pictures in these dead shopping malls, you know, and so this a shopping mall could be seen as the perfect product of this attitude. A totally fun is the perfect machine to sell, even for people to meet, but then when uh, its, its finance has gone, it, it falls down. So, in a way, in the American model, if, let's say, uh, the heart was the shopping um, center, the aorta was the expressway, the, the, the cells were the houses and the red blood cells were the cars, this split in two system where all you need to live in a way is to have a house, a swimming pool, a basket on, 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 the, on the door and to be connected. But, you know, uh, can we destroy and build a city anew every 30 years? Somehow no. When, when we go without being too romantic about it, one could say we have a feeling that the ancient city behaves better. This is the Euclidean palace in, in Split that hosts very well cafes and so on. So how come, you know, in a way we have the most advanced technologies but not always we are building the best cities? This is a photograph my Batilde Cassani was in the last Biennale in the Monditalia section. She went to see, in this case, in the, the Po River Valley, you have a very, very, very big, big community of Sikhs because there the Sikhs are very good in uh, keeping the cattle. So they immigrated here to keep the cattle, the substitute Italian farmers or cattle owners. And in Novellara, which is a small, typical Italian small town, there's the biggest Sikh festival of Europe. So the space of almost a quite traditional Italian city hosts very well the Sikh feast, annual feast. And we try to um, deal with that in the last um, Biennale we did um, uh, we, uh, an open call for people to send us videos about what's called life adapts to the spaces that uh, adapts to life. It was a little bit of a circular thing. What is the actual relationship between spaces and life? This I'm, I'm talking about design, you know, when we talk about response to needs. This problem of delay, how, how could it go? Can we find both uh, the desire of intimacy, of privacy, and the, uh, the urbanity to live in the inner city. How do we deal with the issue of density? You know, in Europe we are talking again about density as a positive thing. This is a diagram of um, energy consumption uh, in very sparse cities or dense cities. Actually, it's been demonstrated that the greenest household in the suburbs is much more uh, energy consuming than the worst urban apartment for many reasons. Let's say 
an inhabitant of suburbs who consumes at least uh, three times gasoline and two times electricity of one in a city. So today we dream about putting together uh, city and nature, almost that we are afraid to call a building a building. We have all this very, I, I think, psychoanalytical, uh, the idea that the building should become itself nature, which I'm not totally convinced with. But in, again, I think in these schemes uh, that can be very fascinating, you have the same determinism of the Victor Gruen model. And, and there's an article by Christopher Alexander in 1964, which is called A City is Not a Tree. He was saying that that, that kind of planning you saw, uh, if you take the tree as a, as a topological diagram, somehow it says uh, neighborhood units uh, joining into, you know, not a single uh, houses joining in neighborhood units, doing satellite towns and so on. He says the tree system is too schematic in a way where each node is connected to each other one just by a node. He said the historical city more than a tree works as a semi-lattice where each point is connected to the other points by more than one relationship. So I think can we learn without, again, nostalgia to put together city and nature, this is Place de Vosges in Paris, with, without all these oppositions? I mean, can we find the best of the, uh, the say, the, the social exchange, the continuity, the, the vivacity of the city and the environmental values we are striving for? Uh, when I, in 1960, uh, se so, sorry, 75, I read this book, The Limits of Growth, actually it was written by 1972. It was the first mathematical model of the Club of Rome by MIT to see that the things could not go on that way, the things would collapse. Actually, this is, I find my notebook, 1977, Chino Zucchi Artificial Intelligence, where I was studying LISP. So actually I went to MIT because I was so scared of this gloomy future he was expecting us. and. Uh, this is the model with which they uh, made the interaction, this flowing feedback system uh, of uh, the model used by MIT. So I don't know, I can read the fine lines, but how the phenomenon we're talking about influence other, how the food production, starving uh, population economy would interact. What is interesting that since that was 72, uh, they made, um, after 30 years, they try to upgrade and see how the projection of the study would uh, relate to the real numbers. For example, computers were not at that time were not the same thing. Or nobody would predict. So the pre no, what, how, what, what's the relationship between prediction of utopias and what the way it's go? And actually, some of the things did not go exactly the same way, but then they were not so different. So the collapse delayed a little bit, but it's not so different. The, the black lines are the way it really went and the, 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 the dotted lines are the way they were predicted. So um, this, I mean, I'm, I'm semi-ironic, but this, this idea that in any way we cannot respond with architecture in a just in time. I mean, it takes some time to build and if you do something today, you respond to a program today, the things will get built in some years. This is typical also when the crisis went down. Uh, you know, city life in Milano has been built on a program finance which are totally offset from what we are now. But if you do something now, maybe when it gets on the market on built, it, it, things will change. So can we somehow get some attitudes out of it? Uh, one could say maybe we should be more just in time. Maybe we have, can we have better modeling instruments with the computer? Should we re-embed flexibility? I mean, we, should we allow some um, uh, hiatus or degree of freedom between hardware and software, in a sense, the city and its inhabitants? Are we sure that every time a new child is born, we have to build a, a red box on top on, on, on your dwelling? I mean, is that a little bit stupid or trivial, or maybe it's not exactly the way the city works? Then, uh, can we do something which have some kind of uh, adaptability to different situation? Should we retrofit things? We have a lot of buildings today that are either we just 
destroy or for example the idea of reconverting office buildings into housing is a very European thing. I, Milano is full of buildings from the 80s who are totally non-ecological built but either we, we throw them down or we adapt them. Should we look at, um, I'm not say that the knowledge of the ancients, maybe the things we learn are not all that bad, um, and I think public space in the old city is what keeps together. I mean, probably the, 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 the thousands little changes of individual tastes should not completely uh, alter the, uh, the, the pattern of the city. I mean, the city should survive its inhabitants, I think. So durability could be an issue. And I finish up with two phrases by, one is by Wittgenstein. They said, the young people of today find themselves in a situation in which a good intelligence does not suffice anymore to deal with the strange requests of life. In fact, it is not sufficient anymore to be good players. Another question arises continuously, sorry, continuously, sorry. Is this the game to play right now and which is the right game? We have fragments of knowledge, you know, about the sun, we have a lot of modeling systems, but we know what instruments to apply. I mean, it's useless to shoot to a, you know, to a fly with a bazooka. I mean, so we have instruments, but what are the right instruments? What is the right game to play? I think what we learn, it does not completely tell you when to use the things. So I think we need a lot of reflection of relationship between in instruments and I would say even ideologies of attitudes, let's say, more than ideologies. The second one I took from Adolf Bene in 1923. He wrote Der Moderne Zweckbau, the, say, what's called it's translated like the modern functionalist. And he says, while the function looks for the maximum possible adjustment to a goal as specific as possible, the rationalist is looking for the greatest chance of compliance, compliance with the largest number of necessities. Nothing more understandable for the rationalist is to put an emphasis on form. Form is born with the establishment of human relationships. The lonely man isolated in the midst of nature has no form or problem. The question of form arises together with the union of more individuals and form is the condition which make possible men to live together. I just come from a jury of the Miss Van der Rohe Prize and this morning I was revising the text w which Tony Chapman from London it it will present to the press conference. And the question of agreeing or disagreeing for a jury is very interesting. Do we have shared values we can all force the consensus in or is just raising hand and whimsical applying of a judgment or a power game? That's a very difficult. To find yourself in judge a competition which can affect, uh, affect the city very much, it's a very responsible thing. Do we still own some kind of shared aesthetics even? I think the only really written aesthetics is classicism. In a way, Paul Valéry said, academicism is a way of, let's say, sharing, to have some common agreement about aesthetic values. When we chose uh, individualism or romanticism, which is good, freedom, in a way, freedom is also relativism or uh, hermeticism. So I don't think we can go back to academics and classicism, but still can be the city just a battlefield of different ideologies. That's a question I pose to you. And I think, just to finish up to say, I think we still love the city. We like cities, we're very romantic, we travel to see cities. We don't jo just go to cities as, um, let's say, places to do things. We, l we really are sentimental about cities. So before letting, uh, maybe there's something better than the city in, in um, uh, the Archigram in the Osaka affair, they made a statement it's called the Osaka Gram, and they said, do we still need the city or we can just have some kind of moving containers, you know, something like the big bubble of Rainer Barnum, you know, and house. I think, I'm kind of romantic, maybe of an old generation, I still we can get a lot from the cities again, in all senses. Thank you very much. <laughs>